Hi, this is documentary filmmaker John Ziegler. I run the website FramingPaterno.com and for the first time in one place in this video, which should be rather interesting and entertaining, I'm going to discuss the entire role of Scott Paterno in the entire Penn State Jerry Sandusky fiasco that I've been covering for over the last three plus years. Now, I've, just, I've talked about this in bits and pieces in different venues over that time period, but never all in one place. And there have been some recent events that have warranted me doing all of this in one video because context is incredibly important to all of this. Specifically, Scott Paterno has been tweeting a lot of new information about how it is that he allegedly first came to believe or hear that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile. And I believe that this is a key piece in this incredibly complex puzzle to figuring out what really happened in this story as opposed to the media myth that was created in two or three days back in November of 2011. Now, for proper context for all of this, I want to first go through my interactions with Scott, my relationship with Scott, because I know this has caused a lot of consternation for people, a lot of confusion, and understandably so for people. Because if you are looking at this story from the outside, there are a couple of things that will prevent most people and virtually everybody in the news media from understanding what really happened. The first, of course, is how do you understand how the Penn State Board of Trustees would fire Joe Paterno and essentially Graham Spanier? and pay off all that money to alleged victims of Jerry Sandusky if they weren't guilty. Because wouldn't the Penn State Board of Trustees have a huge incentive to protect Penn State or defend Penn State? Well, no, <laughs> actually they wouldn't. And most Penn Staters who have followed this story by now fully understand that apparent conflict of interest that upside down incentives. I've talked numerous times about how this case, understanding this case, requires people to get that there were upside down incentives. The media is too stupid and too biased to understand this. But the Penn State Board of Trustees, in the middle of that firestorm, panicked and had a huge incentive to get rid of Joe Paterno before a home game on that Saturday that was going to be broadcast by ESPN that they were going to perceive as a pep rally for a pedophile protector. Plus, you add in the fact that people like John Surma, who was basically doing a coup d'etat on the Board of Trustees, wanted Paterno gone for many years, and a whole list of other elements of a perfect storm. And it's very understandable how it is that the Paterno firing, the Spanier essential firing, and the free report which followed have absolutely nothing to do with Penn State pleading guilty. In fact, it is a small group of people protecting their own asses from an incredibly stupid decision they made in a panic situation and then placating the media by pleading guilty for things that never actually happened. And of course, this is snowballs into the settlements and once everybody is locked into the notion that Jerry Sandusky is obviously the worst pedophile in history uh, and the free report comes out, it's Katie bar the door, it's all over with. So. That's the Penn State Board of Trustees. And most people, again, who have followed this understand it. They get it. It has been more confusing for people who follow the story to understand Scott Paterno's role. Because after all, Scott Paterno is Joe Paterno's son. He was also very critically his lawyer through critical stages of this investigation. So for most people, they think, well, gee, Scott's incentives and Joe Paterno's incentives are obviously aligned. He's his son, he's his lawyer, he was there during critical points of the entire situation, and I was absolutely one of those from the beginning who thought, well, okay, it's impossible for certain things to be true because I can't figure out why Scott did the things that he did or didn't do the things that he did. Uh, they don't make any sense because how would this be in Joe Paterno's best interest, for instance, for Scott Paterno to go out on the Paterno family lawn on November 8th of 2011, right in the middle of this firestorm, and uh, effectively, and, that, and this is not exaggeration, declare Jerry Sandusky to be guilty, say a prayer for the victims who had been damaged 
badly, he said, in front of a huge crowd and cameras. Why would they do that unless they thought that Jerry, in fact, was guilty or knew that Jerry was guilty? Of course, I've always wondered, well, gee, isn't that maybe the best, if not only, evidence of a cover-up that Scott Paterno knew immediately that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile. How is that possible based upon the incredibly scant, now mostly inaccurate information we had at that time? But I mean that mostly in a joking fashion because I don't believe there was a cover-up. But Scott Paterno, really, if you want to look at it from that perspective, provided by far the best evidence that maybe there was a cover-up because how else do you know Jerry's guilty at that point? So that was one of the many things that confused the heck out of me. And so I want to go back to the beginning of the story and then go in order, chronological order, to how we got to where we are today. And maybe by understanding my interactions with Scott, you can better get a feeling for what really happened here, specifically with Scott, and why it, I believe now, very strongly, is 100% consistent with my theory of this entire case, which is that everybody was innocent that this was simply the, the worst perfect storm that's ever happened in the modern history uh, of media and that the news media basically blew this from A to Z. Now, when I was watching this story evolve back in November 2011 from Southern California with really no dog in the hunt other than the fact that it felt to me like Joe Paterno was getting railroaded and that I did not trust the media at all to get this story right. Uh, my BS detector was immediately at a nine because I felt like this story didn't make any sense as we were being told uh, that it happened. And I also knew that the news media was incredibly vulnerable, especially ESPN, to screwing this up. And so my f the first time I ever even heard of Scott Paterno was his, his pathetic um, and very ill-fated attempt to, I don't even, I wouldn't even say defend Joe Paterno in the middle of that firestorm because, uh, you know, there's that famous uh, pictures, videos of Joe and Scott going from the Paterno home into the car to go to his last practice and the media horde is there. This is after Joe Paterno's press conference had been canceled that Tuesday morning and, you know, Scott turns and <laughs> makes a couple of very weak attempts at a, at a statement they did absolutely nothing positive. Uh, it was a disaster. He kept stopping his attempt to make a statement, then restarting as he was waddling back up to the house. And it was awful. I mean, it made Joe look weak. It made Joe look, frankly, guilty. Um, and I always felt immediately at the time, and this is not 2020 hindsight, that the right play at that moment was to say, screw Penn State, canceling the press conference, we are going to hold our own, not press conference, because the press conference would have been a disaster because Joe couldn't even hear. But instead of doing a press conference, just have Tom Rinaldi of ESPN into the kitchen, do a one-on-one -on -one interview. Tom Rinaldi was clearly chomping at the bit to, to interview Joe. He was in town. He would, it would have been a softball. Joe would have charmed the pants off of him. It would have, at the very least, bought time, because that's what they needed at that moment, to buy time. And Part of me felt sorry for Scott at that time period. I just thought, <clears throat> well, here's a guy who's in over his head. He's never done this before. It's a very difficult situation. And, you know, I didn't have disdain for Scott. I just thought he had screwed it up. But I thought most people probably would have screwed it up under those circumstances. So as I started to get into the story and started to, to cover it and create the website, FramingPaterno.com, and... I did a, started to do a documentary film, and I went to State College, and I met Scott. You know, on paper, Scott and I should have gotten along great. Uh, he is a conservative. I'm a conservative. Uh, we have similar, I guess, feisty personalities. Uh, you Obviously, we were on the same side of believing that Joe Paterno had gotten railroaded, but um, I did not have a good interaction with Scott. It wasn't awful at the beginning. Uh, but it was not good. I did not get a good feeling from him. Uh, and I guess the moment they crystallized for sure, a couple of things, including the fact that uh, Scott and I were not going to get along, two, uh, that my efforts here were not going to be successful on the path that they were on, 
occurred when I went to that very first football game, the season after Joe Paterno's death, and I was in Franco Harris's suite, and Sue Paterno was there, and Scott Paterno was there, as were Anthony Lebrano and, and a couple other people who I was planning on interviewing for my documentary film while I was in State College. And long story short, I wanted to get a simple piece of video, not an interview, just a piece of video of Sue Paterno sitting with Franco and a couple other people that I was going to be interviewing so that I could use it in the film that I was making. And I asked uh, the Paterno, Scott, I guess what I was told was the person to ask, whether or not uh, I could do this out of an abundance of caution, and Scott said no. And I thought this was very odd, and I, I, I thought, okay, well, Scott, what would, you know, I've tried to get an explanation, and his explanation was that he didn't want anything out there with Sue um, sitting with Franco or something to that extent, not that there was anything wrong with Franco, but just he didn't want any publicity as if I was going to release this immediately. And more importantly, it was very obvious to me that ESPN was going to show Sue Paterno and Franco together in the box watching the game, which of course is exactly what happened. So effectively, here I was on his side. I wasn't only able to get a very simple shot and ESPN, the enemy, was publishing that, publicizing this on live national television. And I thought, boy, Scott is a jackass and an idiot. Um, but there were also several things that Scott said during our first conversations that didn't quite fit. And I thought, how does that make any sense? And one of them had to do with his support of Mike McQuarrie, which was oddly strong, although it's not anymore, which I think is very significant, but um, also his relationship with Joe Posnanski, which I think is key here. Joe Posnanski wrote the book Paterno. He was there during that last year uh, leading up into the, to the firestorm and the fiasco, and Posnanski is very, very good to Scott in the book, and in fact, makes it seem as if Scott was the first person to know that Joe Paterno was going to get fired, that he was the, the smart one, he was sounding the alarm bells, and that Scott was basically the hero here. I'm, was, I don't think that word is used, but that's the sense that you get. And in the book, uh, Joe Posnanski quotes Scott Paterno as having said, Joe, I think you're going to get fired here, or something to that effect. And I say to Scott, Scott, aren't you concerned at all that as <clears throat> that is quoted in the book, it makes it seem as if you think that the firing was valid? And he completely blew me off and said, you know, no, I don't think that's, that's the case at all. And I thought, okay, well, that's odd because the way the news media was taking everything out of context, it was obvious to me that that's what they could perceive out of that because that's what they would want to. They would love to have Scott Paterno essentially acknowledging that Joe Paterno's firing was valid. Then the other thing that I said to him, which I got a strange reaction to, was I was the first person, I think, at least I'm aware of, it seemed like it based on his reaction, to give him the theory or talk to him about the theory of what about the notion that Joe's recollection might have been misrefreshed by somebody, whether it was Mike McQuarrie or the prosecution or somebody, to where he didn't remember what Mike McQuarrie had told him 10 years earlier, but that before his grand jury testimony, somebody plants, you know, figuratively, plants the word sexual nature or something like that. And Scott wanted nothing to do with that theory. He ran away from it, didn't want to talk about it. I thought, gee, even if it's not true, because at that time I, I didn't know if there was any evidence to support it, it would just seem like a logical theory or possibility, you would think that Scott would want to latch on to that, even just from a political standpoint, because it's an effective way to defend Joe. And so that didn't make a lot of sense to me. But for a very long time, I was still trusting Scott for all intents and purposes. I thought, well, maybe he's dumb, maybe he's incompetent, but he, he absolutely has to have as his most important self-interest here, 
the defense of Joe Paterno, and, and I always thought that he was interested in the truth. I thought it seemed like, anyway, to me, that he wanted the truth. That's what Joe said that he wanted. So I guess I just presumed that Scott would feel the same way. And, you know, our, our relationship was rocky, but it was, we were still communicating. Um, Scott did absolutely nothing to help the documentary film. In fact, I believe uh, gave a statement to the press that they had nothing to do with it. They don't uh, endorse it or anything like that. The, the, the frame, framing of Joe Paterno film, which you can find on YouTube and at our website, framingpaterno.com. But I expected that. I mean, I, I, once that whole ESPN thing happened with the suite, I, I wrote Scott off as ever even potentially being helpful. I knew that was never going to happen. So even though I should have been pissed off, I, I really wasn't. But then once I interviewed Jerry Sandusky in prison, I got a very, very different view of Scott Paterno. And things started to click and started to make more sense to me. Uh, and that is because I had tried to contact Scott several times during that week to alert him as a courtesy. Hey, I'm interviewing Jerry. I think I may have even wanted to ask him if he wanted me to ask Jerry anything because I'm still under this delusion that Scott cared about the truth and maybe we could fill in some, some you know, missing pieces here. And Scott was sick that week. At least that's what he said. I, I believe him, like, but that's what he said. Uh, and so he never got back to me until after I returned from interviewing Jerry, and I guess it started to leak out. I'm, I'm almost positive it was Anthony Lebrano, who was you know, basically a pipeline from whatever I was saying to, to Scott. And uh, so Scott calls me up uh, the weekend after I did the interview with Jerry. And this phone call, I've had a lot of, I've had hundreds of phone calls on this case. This is by far the most stunning and maybe the most important phone call I've ever had as far as figuring out what really happened here, especially in retrospect. Uh, because you would think that Scott Paterno would be very interested in what Jerry had to say, right? You didn't have to believe all of it, but you would think that considering everything that happened and Jerry had at that point never given a detailed statement, never answered really detailed questions about the case, certainly not from the perspective that I was coming from, which was the defense of Joe Paterno, because that was my entire focus when I interviewed Jerry the first time in prison, defending Joe Paterno in Penn State. You would think that Scott would be interested in that. Not only was he not interested in that, he wasn't remotely interested in that, and he was irate, not just a little bit irate, he was immediately before finding out anything about what happened, and by the way, he did not have a full understanding about what had occurred, even though he thought he did, because that's the way he is. He's very arrogant. So he did not have good information, and he immediately went into a diatribe on me for about 15 minutes, profanity lay, screaming, yelling, cursing me out, not asking me. He asked me one question, one question, and I think it was a facetious one. Something to the effect of, is it true that Jerry doesn't like my dad? And I said, well, yeah, which, by the way, was a key for me to understanding what really happened here, because I misinterpreted that. At the time, I presumed Jerry was guilty, and I thought, boy, this is really odd for Jerry to have any kind of disdain for Joe Paterno. And by the way, I probably exaggerated how much disdain that he had for Joe Paterno because I was expecting him to have enormous sympathy for Joe Paterno because I'm assuming he's guilty and therefore he has enormous guilt about what he did to Paterno. Well, the reality is it's exactly the opposite. The only way it makes any sense for Jerry Sandusky under these circumstances to have even a tinge of disdain for Joe Paterno is if he's innocent and realizes that Joe's testimony was a huge part of the reason why he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Now that makes sense. And frankly, if I was in Jerry Sandusky's shoes based upon what I now currently believe to be the truth, I'd be even way more pissed at Joe Paterno than Jerry Sandusky was at that time. But that was the only question that Scott Paterno asked me. Only one. The rest of it, he said a lot of things 
that were nothing more than attacks on me that were not just a little bit false, but totally false. Scott was saying things to me that, about me that I knew to be ridiculous, not just untrue, but ridiculous. So I started to then think, well, geez, if Scott really believes this about me, then obviously he might believe things about the case that are also completely untrue, not to mention the fact that it made me think he was potentially a liar because many of the things he was saying about me were so obviously untrue that he had to know that they were untrue. For instance, uh, he, he pretended that I had made a, a racist joke about O.J. Simpson having dated a white wife and threatened to use that to destroy my relationship with Franco Harris, who also has a white wife. Well, none of that was true, not to mention the fact that he, the threat was very telling about where Scott's head really was here. So that phone call changed everything in my mind because I was like, oh my gosh, Scott doesn't care about the truth at all. He has a very, very narrow view of what narrative he's willing to accept. And it's all about what Mike McQuarrie said. In fact, twice during that phone conversation, he says to me, I will never let anything negative about Mike McQuarrie be said in the name of this family. Well, that's changed rather dramatically in recent months where Scott has tweeted numerous times that he seemingly no longer believes that McQuarrie is telling the truth and no longer believes that McQuarrie saw sex and believes that McQuarrie changed his story uh, on at least one or two occasions, if not more than that. I think that probably happened because of McQuarrie's later testimony uh, where all of a sudden, out of the blue, way after Joe has died, all of a sudden McQuarrie's saying that he and Joe talked about this on a yearly basis, maybe even more than that, and that Joe was blaming uh, Old Main and all sorts of things that don't make any sense and which he had never mentioned before and which apparently Sue Paterno is quite certain are not true. So it's clear to me that way too late, the relationship between Mike McQuarrie and Scott Paterno, whatever that was based on, and I don't know what it was based on, but it, whether it was just mutual self-interest or something deeper than that, I'm not sure, but clearly that has soured. But for him to say to me that he was never gonna let anything bad about Mike McQuarrie be said, when at that time, we already knew there was a lot of reasons to doubt Mike McQuarrie's story, and that Mike McQuarrie's story was the basis for the entire destruction of his father, that blew me away. And he and I got into a debate about, well, wait a minute, I don't believe any assault occurred the night McQuarrie was there, and I think I can prove it. And Scott wanted no part of that, which you would think he would absolutely want that because that's the exoneration of Joe Paterno. So as time went on, Scott and I became in an absolute war. When I went on the Today Show, he put out a ridiculous statement condemning me before he ever even heard what I said on the Today Show. So before he ever heard what I said on the Today Show, and before he heard one word of what Jerry said in the interview, he condemned me and the entire process, which of course, to the news media, was all they needed to say, oh, well, this can't be credible, because in their little minds, the truth can't be any better for Joe Paterno than what Scott Paterno says that it is which in their minds, in their little minds, I understand why that works, but they don't understand the story. So they don't understand Scott's true incentives here. And I've always felt that Scott was compromised by a couple of very important things. One of which, of course, is that he was a Republican lobbyist. Well, what does that mean? Well, we got a new Republican governor, Tom Corbett, a Republican AG's office, and Scott Paterno is not gonna cross them in a million years. I mean, it's just not in his makeup. One, he's gonna believe them because they're his people. So when they say Jerry Sandusky is a pedophile and they, believe, and they say that Curly and Schultz helped cover it up, he's gonna inherently believe that to a certain degree because they're his people. And he has a self-interest in not crossing them because his livelihood depends on it. Also, because he declared Jerry Sandusky guilty on November 8th of 2011, he has a huge incentive for that to be true. And that's maybe the most important thing you need to know about Scott Paterno. Because if Jerry Sandusky is innocent, then this is all Scott Paterno's fault. And I mean all of it. Because once Scott Paterno goes on the Paterno family line and makes that statement, a number of things happen. Number one, 
The news media now knows Jerry Sandusky is guilty because why else would the Paternos be condemning him under these circumstances? Number two, the Board of Trustees now has zero to fear about presuming Sandusky's guilt, which allows them to then fire Paterno and essentially Spanier. Because they're never going to fire Paterno and Spanier unless they at least know Sandusky's guilty. <laughs> because if it turns out Sandusky's innocent, now they're the biggest idiots in the history of the world. So that can't happen. But they don't have to worry about that anymore because Scott already alleviated that problem. So that is a huge moment. And Scott, because partially because of Posnansky's book, and I'm sure within the family, it's thought that Scott was the guy who did his best to try to save a bad situation, that he was the family hero, when in fact, he's the reason Joe got fired, Spanier got fired, and has effectively started the domino effect that allowed for Jerry Sandusky's railroading, because everything flows from that. Because when Joe is fired the next day, it's over for Jerry Sandusky, because that is seen worldwide as a guilty plea by Penn State on behalf of Jerry Sandusky, and every single trial lawyer in the state, if not the country, knows that Penn State is now on the hook for, in the, in the headline of Business Insider the next morning, $100 million for the supposed victims. And now we have an avalanche. We go from two people claiming sex, neither of them in a credible fashion against Jerry Sandusky at the time of his arrest, to eventually upwards of 30 alleged victims getting millions of dollars from Penn State. And that happens because of Joe Paterno's firing, which happens because of the screw up on multiple levels by Scott Paterno. And so Scott and I have battled publicly. We've also battled privately. I also want you to know that a year or so ago, I don't remember the exact date, I actually sent Scott an email because even though we were battling, he was still responding and back and forth. I was responding to him via email, usually in very, very nasty terms. But I sent him an email saying, look, I believe Jerry is innocent. I believe this is the only way Joe ever gets exonerated. This is silly for us to be fighting like this. We can help each other. And I would like to educate you, I'm paraphrasing here, I would like to educate you as to why I'm not just suspicious that Jerry's innocent, I'm basically positive that Jerry is innocent. And it was a very high road email. I was not in all vindictive, it was not sarcastic, it was very sincere. I got zero response. From Scott, which was very unusual for him, um, but very telling nonetheless. So since then, Scott has attacked me numerous times on Twitter, almost all nonsensically and usually 180 degrees counter to the facts. I'll give you an example. On the day of the anniversary of his father's death, at like, I think one or two in the morning, something crazy like that, Scott tweets clearly about me, that I had either asked or demanded a million dollars from him to do a documentary on this subject. And that is flat out false. I remember the conversation very specifically. He asked me, he asked me, what would it take to do a documentary about this and do it right? I said, I don't know, but at least a million dollars. That's not asking him for a million dollars. In fact, in a bazillion years, I would never ask Scott Paterno for a dime. One, because I knew he wouldn't give it to me. But two, probably more importantly, it would destroy any credibility I had. By the way, I've never specifically asked anybody for money who hasn't come to me first offering it. So, and I certainly have never made a dime on this. Everything that has been donated to this cause and more has been used uh, to, for specific resources to try to find and publicize the truth of this case. So I'm as clean as a whistle on this particular issue, but this is, this is all Scott has. <laughs> this is the best Scott can do, is to throw out these attacks on Twitter. Um, and he's always name calling me, he's never being specific, and of course always mocking me for 
believing in Jerry and believing in Jerry's innocence when Scott doesn't know the full facts of the case. And it's obvious that he doesn't because he doesn't want to, because he wants a very narrow view of the truth because it fits his self-interest, because of what he did at the very beginning of the story. Now, we've learned quite a bit recently from Scott. Very importantly, a few months ago, it may have been a little bit longer than that, Scott suddenly starts tweeting about McQuarrie, the guy he was never going to say anything bad about, and about Joe's testimony. And for the first time, publicly at least, Scott indicates that guess what? My theory about Joe's recollection being misrefreshed is potentially dead on. In fact, he says on Twitter that the first time Joe ever heard the term or he ever heard the term sexual nature involved in this case was when the Office of the Attorney General said those words to Joe, not the other way around, just before his grand jury testimony. Now that's critical. And why in the world Scott held that back, I have no idea, other than the fact that maybe he had just bought in to the idea that it was of a sexual nature and never bothered to even think about combating that when that was the narrative that destroyed his father. So Scott tweets that out. He also says that, which is again, incredibly important. If Joe Paterno had his recollection misrefreshed by the Office of the Attorney General just before his grand jury testimony, that's an enormous element of the case. Huge, because it explains, and not just by the way, against Joe Paterno, against Jerry Sandusky, too, because without Joe Paterno saying sexual nature, there's nothing backing Mike McQuarrie up. Nothing. Not, not Graham Spanier, not Gary Schultz, not Tim Curley, not his actions, not the Dr. Uh, Dranoff, not even his own dad, because his dad's got dementia or whatever. There's nothing backing Mike McQuarrie up, and there's a mountain of evidence that McQuarrie, at, at best, is misremembering or has been manipulated into saying something that did not happen. And remember, McQuarrie gets the date, the month, and the year of the event totally wrong, which you would never do under these circumstances if you saw the rape of a child, and you certainly would never think that it happened after 9-11 when it actually happened before 9-11. So Scott also tweets out that he's not sure if McQuarrie may have misrefreshed Joe's recollection, and even tweets out that, to his knowledge, Mike's never been asked the question, at least not under oath, which implies very strongly to me that Scott believes that he should be asked that question, which is mind-blowing, coming from the same guy who had that conversation with me just after I had interviewed Jerry Sandusky in prison. So it's clear that Scott and his thinking is evolving, but now it's not making any sense. Because at least before, Scott had a was working on a theory that while false, made sense. Or if you believe a rape occurred, and so you believe McQuarrie, and you believe Jerry's guilty, that all makes sense. But what, here's the part that doesn't make any sense at all. So now you're saying McQuarrie's not trustworthy. Your dad's testimony didn't really back up McQuarrie. Nobody backs up McQuarrie. But you still believe Jerry's guilty? You can't possibly be sure of that, Scott, because, Scott, because Mike McQuarrie was one of two pillars on which the case was built when you declared Jerry Sinusky guilty on November 8, 2011. Mike McQuarrie and Aaron Fisher. And I've done extensive work on Aaron Fisher, which you can see at framingpaterno.com. And nobody in his hometown of Lock Haven, or seemingly nobody in Lock Haven, believes Aaron Fisher's story because he's clearly lying. So how do you conclude Jerry's guilty if you don't believe McQuarrie anymore? And all you got left at the beginning there is Aaron Fisher. Everything else happens after the avalanche caused by Joe Paterno's firing. That's mind-blowing to me. But it gets even more mind-blowing by the next revelation that Scott Paterno drops, which is really the reason why I'm doing this video now. So in the last week or so, Scott has tweeted intermittently that the first time he ever heard that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile, was in August, might have been September, of 2010, when told by Penn State reporter, Penn State football reporter for the, for the Patriot News, David Jones, 
and that David Jones had told him that Jerry was a pedophile and that Joe had covered it up. Now this is extraordinary on a number of levels. And I believe very strongly that Scott has completely misinterpreted uh, these events in a way that uh, has caused him to basically go into 9-11 truth or conspiracy land with a, a theory or a scenario that makes absolutely no sense. So what Scott and David Jones are claiming happened is that Jones somehow got word or a leak way before Mike McQuarrie ever became known to the Office of the Attorney General that there was this episode allegedly the McQuarrie episode, even though the evidence strongly indicates that it was not the McQuarrie episode. But in retrospect, Jones wants everyone to believe it's the McQuarrie episode because that's the sexy one. And I don't mean that uh, literally, obviously, but that's the one that got the most juice. So here's what occurs. So Jones and Scott Paterno have a beer, or whatever it was, in August or September of 2010. And Scott, for the first time, hears this notion that Jerry's a pedophile and that Joe covered it up. This has a huge impact, has to have had, a huge impact on Scott Paterno's thinking. Because he's never thought about this before. He doesn't believe it at first to be true, he says. But then a few months later, his dad gets a subpoena to testify in a grand jury investigation of Jerry Sadowski for child molestation. Well, obviously, any human being is going to think back to the David Jones conversation and go, oh my gosh, this must be true. Well, what Scott isn't realizing is, first of all, David Jones is a guy who completely blew the Rashard Casey story, the story of the Penn State quarterback who was falsely accused of beating up a police officer just a year before the McQuarrie episode occurred. And by the way, the Rashard Casey case, I believe, has a huge impact on all of this on numerous levels, including, by the way, me, because I was one of those on Philadelphia Talk Radio and WIP that was condemning Joe Paterno for standing by Rashard Casey, and I was wrong. Well, a year later, the McQuarrie episode occurs. And I don't think, I think those two things absolutely influence each other. So here's a guy, David Jones, who could not have been more wrong on the Richard Casey situation. Getting in a fight with Graham Spanier about it. Spanier recalls that, that Jones even implied that he was a racist somehow. Uh, and of course, never apologized once it turned out he was wrong. A guy who hates Penn State, David Jones, hates Joe Paterno, lied about the Bill O'Brien leaving interview. First saying that O'Brien wasn't leaving, then after O'Brien leaves says, oh yeah, by the way, I knew he was leaving and I did an off the record interview that I have a tape recording of, uh, or apparently I have a tape recording of, which I'm not gonna release. Uh, he's a liar. He hates Penn State, he's a liar, and he's been wrong before on a case involving discipline of a, of a Penn State entity or Penn State person, Richard Casey. This is the worst possible guy to believe. And that's who Scott Paterno is believing for some reason. And there's even more reason not to believe David Jones, because David Jones did not have good information at the time. And here's how we know. Scott, in his wackadoodle 9-11 truth or conspiracy theory, believes that because David Jones played basketball with Frank Fina, the guy who was running the Attorney General's case against Sandusky, that somehow this alone in a small town is a connection that proves that Fina is the leak to Jones. Well. Um, this makes no sense at all, because in August or September 2010, they have no idea who Mike McQuarrie is in relation to the Sandusky case. And if they do, if that's true, then guess what? Everything we think we know about this case is false. The Attorney General's office was engaged in massive corruption, and therefore Sandusky has to be innocent because the whole thing is made up. I don't believe any of that. But that's what you have to believe to believe Scott's theory of FINA leaking to Jones. Jones claims, after the fact, after the crap hits the fan, that this was McQueary he knew about. He's flat out either lying or dumb. And here's how we know. Not only was McQueary not known, and McQueary had never told his story to anybody uh, other than the particulars of the case, uh, and it was not the same story he told 10 years later, but not only is McQueary not known, but Scott acknowledges that the details that Jones gives were not graphic, as Jones now claims, were not consistent with McQuarrie's current story, and an email that was sent to Graham Spanier by one of Jones's colleagues at his direction, because Jones has said this publicly, 
makes it very clear that the, the episode they're questioning him about, Grant and Spanier about, was when Sandusky was still an employee at Penn State and involved a police or criminal investigation. Well, that has to be 1998 if it's anything at all. Because in 1998, Sandusky is still an employee, and there was a police and criminal investigation where the DA investigated and exonerated Jerry Sandusky, and there were rightly no charges. So that's completely consistent with 1998 and inconsistent with 2001 and Mike McQuarrie. Duh, it's obvious. Also making this clear is how Jones and the Patriot News responded to getting nowhere in their initial in investigation of this. So an, in an email goes to Spanier. This is the first time Spanier's ever heard anybody claiming Jerry Sandusky is a pedophile. He responds to the email saying, I don't know anything about this. Could you tell me more? They don't even bother to return Spanier's email. This is the biggest scoop in the history of the world for them, and they don't return an email. Then David Jones decides he's going to go to Sandusky's house. Dottie answers the door the day after Jerry retires from the second mile, and Jones claims he asks Dottie about a criminal investigation involving Jerry Sandusky. That makes no sense at all. One, because Dottie doesn't remember it, she would have, and because Jones himself quotes Dottie as saying, go ask the second mile, which is 100% consistent with Jones having asked about the retirement from the second mile, which is what Dottie remembers him asking about, and not about a criminal investigation, because why would Dottie say, go ask the second mile about a criminal investigation? That would be absurd. And I believe Dottie talked to her about it extensively. Her story makes a hell of a lot more sense than David Jones. Then, <laughs> typical of this incredibly insane case, I, of course, asked Jerry about this. I write him a letter in prison, or an email in prison, and he can't respond to emails, so he writes back a letter about this whole deal. Well, not only does Jerry not recall anything about this situation. He quote says, and I posted this on Twitter and Facebook, I don't know a David Jones. <laughs> not, not just a denial of that it happened, he doesn't even remember there, who David Jones is. Now, some nut jobs and, and morons out there have said, well, this proves that Jerry is lying because how could he not know Jones? He could easily not know Jones or not remember him. He was an assistant coach who had been retired. He's now been retired for a long time. He retired in 1999. The more important element of this is Jerry has no incentive to lie, especially not in that fashion. And by the way, he actually has a huge incentive for this story to be true because if it is true, it proves massive attorney general corruption because they completely lied about when they got in touch with McQuarrie. Not to mention they're leaking to a reporter who's admitting it in August of 2010, or September of 2010. So Jerry's not lying. Whether he is not remembering his interaction with David Jones, I don't know. But the more important element of this is, this proves Jones didn't pursue the lead, the leak, or the rumor that he heard. Which tells me the leak wasn't very good, it couldn't have come from FINA, it wasn't graphic, and most likely, Oxum's razor, the simplest explanation, is that somehow they get wind of 1998. They do a little bit of an investigation. They realize, oh, this got looked into. There were no charges. We're not getting anywhere. Uh, I'm going to drop it. And by the way, how do they find out about this? I don't know. Allegedly, the Attorney General's office doesn't know about 1998 at this point. Could that be a lie? Sure, because obviously there was a record of it. There was a criminal investigation. So it is theoretically possible they knew about this. But what's also interesting is the timing of this. August, September of 2010 is exactly the time in which Don Fisher, or Don Hennessy, whatever the heck her name is at this point, the mother of Aaron Fisher, both in her book and in the Kane report, is making it very clear she, her hair is on fire because they have not arrested Jerry Sandusky, and she is all over the internet trying to find, both find evidence of Jerry Sandusky's abuse of kids as well as find other victims, uh, and I believe actually creating an echo chamber on the internet by putting out rumors about Jerry, which other people then see and facilitate. It certainly is an amazing coincidence 
An amazing coincidence, the timing of this, that at that very moment when Dawn's hair is on fire and she's all over the internet, David Jones hears a rumor about something involving Jerry Sandusky being a pedophile, which he does not follow up very strongly at all. I mean, you have to look at this much like McQueary. McQueary doesn't act like he saw a rape at all, and Jones doesn't act like he has the greatest scoop in the history of the world either. Not even close. In fact, it's very obvious that what happens, much like McQuarrie, is that Jones afterwards, in retrospect, in hindsight, after the crap has hit the fan, looks back and goes, oh, I must have known about McQuarrie because I want to show that I'm the person in the know and I had that information. He's so dumb he doesn't even realize it makes him look bad because, well, wait a minute, you had information about this and you didn't go to police or you didn't do anything about it, you didn't even report it, but that's how moronic these media people are. So here's the bottom line of all this. This is an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. One, because it, it creates a better understanding of Scott Paterno's mindset for when he declares Jerry Sandusky guilty. And I actually have some small sympathy for him, although he had no right to believe an anti-Penn State, anti-Paterno liar like David Jones. Number two, Jones is lying about what he thought he knew back in 2010, and it's obvious he is not credible at all whatsoever. Um, and number three, the reality is all of this is 100% consistent with the basic reality of this case, which is that there was a perfect storm that pointed in the direction of Jerry Sandusky getting railroaded, a situation where there was no actual evidence that people who were very influential started to believe something that was not true, for which there was no evidence. And once they started to believe that, they saw everything through that prism. And it started a snowball down the mountain that turned into an avalanche that created the greatest injustice in the modern history of this country, at least that I'm aware of, and one that I will continue to report on because no one else is doing it, no one else has figured it out. And the reason why no one else has figured it out is no one understands Scott Paterno and his real incentives like I do, and of course you do, now that you've watched this video. Please uh, keep checking in with FramingPaterno.com for more information and videos on this case, which will be continuing until this thing is finally, if ever, over. Thanks for watching.